So starting stream live. I think we're good. Are we? Okay. Can you guys hear us or see us? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think some people were some people were watching the uh, the pre-recorded version. Oh no. <laughs> but I think we should be good now. Uh, feel free to comment in and and let us know. Are we back? Are we? Great now, okay, says good. Valerie. Um, a lot of ladybugs only getting buffering. Looks like it's coming through fine for me. Let's let's do this just to verify that people aren't commenting on the old stream. Uh, comment in and say. Uh, say we can see you on the new stream or something like that. Valerie's not getting any buffering. Ted says I'm not back. He's normally the guy I have help with stuff. Um, hmm. Okay, Valerie says we can see you on the new stream. So some people yeah, a lot of a lot of people are saying okay. that they can see us. Okay, so I think we're officially and only thirty eight minutes late. That's I not know. terrible for me. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> All right, so what do we got going on today? So today I have I'm all thrown off now by my introductions and the things I have planned. We have got Aaron Rutten. He is a digital artist here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to him. He has amazing tips. And I actually feel a little bit guilty, Aaron. I didn't realize I wasn't subscribed to you. I just watch oh, your videos okay. when you link them on Facebook. So yeah. yeah, I'm terrible. But I'm subscribed now, so I can learn all the cool. awesome things you teach. Yeah, thank you. You have some great videos as well. Um, getting when I started out as a YouTuber, uh, you're one of the first art channels that I came across. And so it's been inspirational to be able to see what you've accomplished on YouTube and otherwise. So thanks for having me. Well, thanks for joining and being patient with me learning how to use OBS. Aaron's been teaching me how to use a program, which you guys should be really grateful for, because in the future, I'm going to be using it to live stream and answer your questions while I'm painting. And he basically just taught me how to do that. Yeah, I, I, I we, we learned together uh, some of the the bugs of working with live streaming and OBS. Uh, apparently, all you had to do was restart your computer, and that, that yeah, fixed it. Yeah, it fixed so all the things. It's it's funny. We tried all these other super complicated things, and then the simplest thing is what fixed it. So there you go. So if you guys want to start submitting some of your questions, feel free to do that. We are here to answer your art questions instead of where normally I have an art Q&A video on Thursday. We're doing this instead. Yeah, oh, that's cool. I uh, got lots of comments here, so your, your so viewers So while we here. wait for questions, then I'm going to ask you some of my questions, Aaron. What made you get started with digital painting? Um, with digital painting, um, I had I had been getting into graphic design and website design and things like that, and a little bit of animation. And I was using Adobe Flash to do animation, and I was drawing with my mouse a lot. And one day I picked up this book for Adobe Flash, and it mentioned this brush that uses pen pressure. And I was like, you know, you can vary, vary the, the width of the line with the pressure of the pen, just like you would with an ink pen. And I was like, well, what the heck is that? So I went out and got a tablet, and it was like the coolest thing I'd ever seen. You know, now I can, rather than clicking with this mouse to try to draw art like I'd been doing since the 90s, <laughs> um, now I had a pen and I could actually draw on the screen and I, I discovered the software is very, very sophisticated and uh, Corel Painter specifically is what I use. It's it's geared specifically towards traditional, traditional artists or people who come from a traditional background. And so you, you kind of feel a lot like you're, what you're drawing on the computer feels a lot like what you're drawing on paper or on canvas. And so once I discovered that, I just fell in love with it. Um, that was in, I want to say in the 2000s, probably, I don't know, 10, 
10 or so years ago is, is probably when I started doing, doing it on a tablet. Before that, I had used things like, you know, Kid Picks and Mario Paint and different applications that, you know, I guess you could consider to be digital art. But at the time when I was using those things, I, I considered those more as like a game rather than an art form. But now I, I have discovered that later in life, what I learned in Mario Paint is essentially what I'm using in my career now, you know, to make YouTube videos and animations and logos and music and all of those things. So nice. Well, we've got tons of questions now. I'm just going to grab one. Um, let's see. Someone asked if I've ever considered drawing digital art. I have, and I have some of that on my website. So you can check that out. But good luck telling the difference between which is which. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I hadn't seen any of your digital art. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, I've got a bunny on there. And I did it on my Samsung Galaxy Note 10 point whatever tablet. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a few things on there, some dogs. But nice. yeah, I used to do some port or some commissions with digital and not anymore, but yes. That's cool. I like, I like painting on the phone. I mean, it, that's something that's kind of evolved to the point now to where it's, it's a little bit easier to do. I started out with an iPad and that, you know, using my finger and that was really tricky. But I think once you get the, once you get a stylus that, that makes it a little easier. And then if you can get a pressure sensitive stylus, I don't know if the note does that. Yes, they are. That's why it uses the same technology as Wacom. And that's yeah. why I stick with those for my phone and for a tablet. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good choice. Um, so yeah, I think I think mobile mobile painting is is fun to do. And then you said you just got a, a Wacom tablet too. Which one did you get? Um, I had the little I don't know the little hundred dollar one where you draw on the thing but you don't see your screen. That did not work out well for me. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting the thirteen inch HD mm. something something. Helpful, got the right? Cintiq. Cintiq 13 HD, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's a good tablet. Yeah, and it's funny because I, one of the reasons everyone asks me to draw or do videos for digital art, I can't because with the arthritis in my neck, I can't look down and that's how I've always drawn or been at an angle where I was down. I recently found out that one of my easels that I have here that I'd never opened before, complete, it has little ridges and it holds the Wacom tablet in there. So I'm kind of excited to do some artwork oh. for the channel digitally. Nice. Yeah, I, I got a Italian steel field travel um, it's like telescoping and that I put my I have a Cintiq companion it's basically the exact same tablet it's just portable it has windows built into it and I, I put it on the on the easel and it works great. like it it feels a lot like your you know like how it would feel to paint on a canvas yeah. when it's someone asks it, you what program did you use to draw on the iPad I used I started out with art rage which is it's good because it has this nice paint depth simulation where you can kind of like build up thick paint and then kind of like scrape it away and blend it. And I like that a lot, but it is slow as heck on the iPad. Also, um, I realized I was super rude when I said someone asks you. It was pencil. Okay. I don't know why I didn't read the name. Sorry about <laughs> that. That was super rude. Some, well, some people have hard names to read too. That was not one of them. That was yeah. me being rude. Um, that's okay. Uh, I was using, yeah, I was using Art Rage and then Pro Procreate came along and I, I like that a lot better. I haven't used it recently, but I'm sure it's probably, you know, 20 times better than it was when I used it years ago. But it's a lot faster. There's a lot more brushes and it's a lot closer to some of the, some of the desktop apps that are out there. So that would be my recommendation. Um, I know you mentioned iPad, but I'll just also mention that if you're using Android, I really like the Infinite Painter app for Android. That, that that has that's a good app. Like that's almost as good as well, I would say. Yeah, it's it's better than some of the desktop apps as far as the amount of brushes it has and the amount of features. I had Sketch Pro, and I still have it on both my tablet. The old version I love. The new ones are terrible, and I hate them, and they are not convenient to use. Mm -hmm. That's why I got the Infinite Painter one. Yeah. But yeah, not a fan of Sketchbook Pro anymore. They no. made some bad choices. Yeah, so. I, I, I've I've tried the desktop version and the mobile version, and I can't say I really yeah, like either. I didn't like I, the I, desktop. I have that too. Did not like it. Mm -hmm. So here's a question, and I know I'm going to get a lot of for this, so I'm going to kind of wrap it up into, or we can both talk about it um, just across the board. So Skiron asks, I have cheap colored pencils. How do I get realistic skin? So here's the thing, everyone is always asking, I don't know if they get, I'm sure you get it for the tablets too. I wanna get a cheap 
alternative to the good stuff? How do I do, they wanna create professional looking work with less, or materials that are not professional. Honestly, my suggestion is to get better pencils or get better paint. You don't have to get all the pencils. You don't have to have every colored pencil there is out there. Get 10 pencils. You can buy them open stock. Get 10 decent pencils and start from there. You're not going to be able to create the same work with the student brand cheap stuff that you can with the higher end pencils. It, it's just a big difference. And I know that everyone is on a budget, especially artists. I get the term starving artist. I was there for a very long time. Save up. Just save your money. Use what you have for now, but save up and get the better pencils. Get the better acrylic paints. Whatever it is, it's not worth spending your money on low-end supplies that aren't going to do what you need them to do. Just get a handful, if you need to, five, ten pencils of good pencils and start from there. Just slowly add on from that point. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, whether it's digital supplies or traditional supplies, cheap is not... It's not always, I guess you have to differentiate between cheap and affordable or reasonably priced, you know, like, is it, is it worth the amount of money you're going to spend on it? And even if it's cheap, even if it's a dollar or $2 or $5, if it's not really worth that, even if it is really cheap, then, you know, there's, there's, there's really no advantage to buying it. Um, in my experience as a traditional artist, I, I made a lot of really, you know, I'd make stuff with like tempera paint and stuff and it, it doesn't, it doesn't hold up. I think it's worth it to, in the end, you don't have to buy the, like the absolute most expensive anything, you know, there's, there's probably something in the middle that you can get that's, that re that's reasonably priced, but it's still going to do the job. Um, and you're, it'll show in the quality of your work and your work will hold up better. It's not going to fall apart. You're not going to have problems, getting skin tones. Speaking from a digital point of view, people ask me all the time, like, well, what's an alternative to a Wacom Cintiq? Because a Wacom Cintiq is, you know, hundreds, thousands of dollars, and that's a lot of money to spend. Um, but the, the alternatives that are out there that are half as much are half of the quality. And I've, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to be able to compare the two and be able to to be able to see the differences in the two. With a with a Wacom tablet, it's more expensive, but it's more expensive because they use better quality parts. They have a team that tests this thing and runs it by artists, and artists give their input and they make it so that it's the best possible device. Because hey, if you're going to spend a couple, if you're going to spend hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, you want that tablet to work. You don't want to have something that's going to irritate you. And in my experience with these cheaper ones, the screen is really glossy. And so it's really hard to see what you're working on versus on a Wacom tablet. The screen has anti-glare and it has a little bit of grain. So it feels like you're drawing on paper. It gives you a little more friction. Um, it, it makes a nice, you know, like kind of papery sound when you draw on it versus the Wacom alternatives. They make this squeaky noise like you're, you know, it's like nails on a chalkboard. It's terrible. Um, another notable difference between a Wacom tablet and the Wacom alternatives is the Wacom pens don't need batteries. So the pens are lighter. You don't have to change the batteries all the time, and they're just better quality pens. They're weighted nicely. They feel comfortable to draw with. They don't fall apart, um, whereas the Wacom alternative pens have to have a, a AAA battery, which makes them heavier. And a lot of the times, if you draw with them a lot, you'll find, like, things will like break off of them. Like if I, sh if I were to go and dig out my old uh, UC Logic pen that I used for a number of years, little screws came out of it and it was just like, it's literally looks like it's a dissolving. Yeah, I get that a lot too with airbrushing. I have had so many students show up to my class. They didn't want to spend the $500 for the full kit that I use, which you can actually get cheaper now because Hobby Lobby carries a lot of it. And you can use your 40% coupon on most of what I use. But I they would go to eBay and get these sets that just fell apart. They didn't work. So you just threw away $50 that could have gone towards you just saving and waiting a little longer and getting the better supplies. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I would just wait and get the better stuff. Ladybug well, Lovers asks, can you use acrylic paint on watercolor paper? Depends on what the results you want are. You technically can use it on anything. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to like the results. It depends on what you want. It soaks in weird to the paper. You would want to probably put a gesso down first so that the paint isn't just 
absorbing into that but I personally don't like painting on paper I've seen amazing work where acrylic artists have painted on watercolor paper so you can do it it just depends on what results you're looking for Yeah, I would say you'd probably want to tape it down or something oh too, yeah because wouldn't it, it would just like, yeah it would work really bad especially if you're using much water with it yeah, and th those are usually pretty, like they have kind of big grain to them too, so that might be kind of weird. You might end up like getting like a more scumbled effect than you'd want to get normally. Yeah, I think they work really well when you're dry brushing. I've seen beautiful Mm hmm dry brushed work done on oh, paper there, with yeah. either oil or acrylic. Uh, again, just depends on what your goals are. Mm hmm. You know, that's that I guess that kind of lends to the to the topic of digital art, too. That's that's kind of one of the things I like about it is they have watercolor brushes and they have acrylic brushes and you don't have to worry about those things like, oh, can I paint watercolor on top of acrylic? If it's digital, sure. You know, you can put oil on top of watercolor and then put acrylic <laughs> on that and then put you don't charcoal have to worry over about that. fat over lean or any of that stuff Yeah, um, to a to a certain degree, depending on the application, you might run into some issues. Like in Corel Painter, for example, they have real real watercolor where it kind of trickles into the paper. It's it's interesting, but if you want it to still be wet and still be able to add other colors into it and have them bleed, you have to keep it wet, and that means that you couldn't like you technically can't paint over it with any brush other than a watercolor brush. You could create a new layer on top of it and then you can paint over it, but it wouldn't really interact in the same way. So there are a few limitations here and there, but for the most part, you can combine everything together. And I think that's kind of fun. So we have Carlos asks, what is your favorite medium and color of all time? Ooh, favorite medium and color of all time. That's, that's a hard one. I mean, I, Obviously, I guess I, I'll have to say digital for, for the medium because that's, you know, that's my thing. But it doesn't mean that I, that I don't enjoy watercolor and ink and, and colored pencil. But I, I would have to say digital because that's how I spend the bulk of my time. Uh, color? I'm the same way about color, too. It's like I like a lot of different colors. Um, I, I would say probably right now, and this changes from year to year, I would say probably like a blue-green is kind of what I'm into lately. How about you? Yeah, um, medium is hard. I wouldn't ever want to choose just one medium to work in. If I had to, it'd probably be acrylic just because it was my first love and I've got the most experience there. But I really would not want to choose just one. Um, for They just all have things that they offer that I love, and I would hate to give up one just to stick with another. So, Yeah. yeah, I love all of them. And teal, as all, everyone knows, I'm obsessed with teal. Yeah. Like my pots, my pans, my, everything. Everything in my house is teal. It's... A bit of a problem. Do you find that that you like uh, like secondary and tertiary colors more than like, you know, red and yellow and blue and just I just. hate primary colors. I like Mm -hmm. all of them. I hate them. I actually straight primary or straight secondary. I don't like either of those. I like mixtures of everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like I like red okay, but I tend to lean more towards like a vermilion where it's you know ever so slightly with a little bit of orange in it. Yeah. So, So but still um, not totally a primary. yeah. <laughs> Let's see, what do we have next? Lots of good questions here and lots of good comments. If you if one stands out to you, go for it. I'm just scrolling Okay. through and picking them out randomly. Let's see here. Um, how about Ladybug's question, is there a good method to start with for sketches? There are 800 different methods to start with for sketches. <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, you want to go first? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can just, I can just throw out a few. Um, for me personally, I, I tend to do primitive shapes. So I'll draw, I'll draw everything as a sphere, cylinder, cube, torus, cone, Um, and, and build things up that way. I'll also use, uh, if I'm going to draw in perspective, if I'm drawing architecture or anything that's really angular, I'll make sure to use perspective guides or vanishing points. Working digitally, I have the advantage of being able to actually like pull up guides on screen and move them around. And you can actually like lock your, 
lock your lines into perspective while you're drawing as if you're using a ruler. So, that, so that's pretty cool. I'll also use things like the rule of thirds. I can pull up a rule of thirds grid. You could also just draw this on your canvas if you wanted to. And that helps you kind of plot things from an aesthetic point of view, you know, like rather than just having your figures dead center, you can have objects within each of these quadrants on the rule of thirds grid. So that's kind of where I start. And then as I'm going through, I might do iterations of sketches where I'll do my basic really rough, really ugly, horrible sketch. And then I'll go over it again on a new layer uh, with the first sketch being a little transparent and then refine that sketch and then maybe do one more over that and then that way, you know, my each each time I do another iteration of that sketch, it gets better and better. I start by dotting things out. Usually, I'll just put like little dots. This is, I I know I want. Let's say I'm drawing a horse. I want the nose of the horse to reach this portion of the paper. I want the ear here. I want, and I just kind of dot things out. And then I'll draw in basic shapes, the ovals, the those things to block everything in, and then kind of connect the dots and the shapes together. But that helps me keep everything within the perspective that I want. You can also use a grid. Somebody, and I'm sorry, I don't know who asked it. It was earlier, asked what about using a grid. Yeah, you can use the grid method. I don't love it myself because I, I used it on a painting I did of James Marsters. It was my first portrait, still one of my favorites. And my grid was so slightly off that he was just a little too thin, too mm -hmm. long. And so it was like, I just erased it and freehanded it and it was easier for me. Yeah. It depends on how your brain works, honestly. Some people will use a grid and it is the best method for them. Some people have a tendency to come out with really sharp, harsh edges. Like they try to get almost too linear in the way that they're following those grid lines lines. Um, for me, it actually took longer to set up and get right. So I don't like the grid, but a lot of people do. So I would say try it and see if you like it. Um, you can just start freehanding without doing any draw dots or circles or anything. I mean, there's so many good ways to get started for sketching. Yeah, the, the grid method can be tricky. I, I had a mural that I was doing. It was a uh, basically painting this this like woman from like the the waist up on a board that ended up getting cut out and then it was mounted on the wall to be part of the mural and i had i had drawn her digitally which was fine and then was going to use the grid transfer method to grid transfer it onto the board but i made my grid too big you know i didn't, didn't make a fine enough grid and so you know it was maybe like like four four big squares for the face and then when i went to go transfer it i went oh wait a minute like it, the grid's too big so i can't really like accurately get it and so what i ended up doing for the grid transfer looked horrible it was like all all jacked up so i had to end up just basically kind of <laughs> erasing most of it and just freehand drawing it anyways because that's what then, i did on that canvas with yeah. james marsters it just yeah <laughs> but for other things it, it's worked i think i think you just you have to really plan it out ahead of time. You can't go, okay, this this grid method is going to work and it's going to save me time because as with any shortcut, if you don't apply it correctly, it's going to make your life harder rather than easier. And that was an example where I, I made it way harder on myself. Um, somebody had a good question and a lot of people agreed with it. Marissa asks, tips for growing on social media? And I'm sure you've got some that I'll, I'll probably I'll probably want to use too. <laughs> well, it depends on the platform. The first thing is that you need to post every single day. And I think as artists, it's hard because you don't necessarily draw every day. You should be, but you may not be or don't have the time to draw every day. Post a photo of your old work. Post a photo of something you've done in the past. You can recycle old content, but post at least once a day. With Facebook, if you post more than once a day, it gets filtered even more heavily because of the way that their analytics work and unless you're paying to promote the post. So I usually will post once a day, sometimes more, but normally I, I go with once there. Um, Instagram, they're changing their analytics, so it's getting to be kind of similar, but minimum once a day. If you are posting once a week, once every other week, people forget why they followed you. So you post something and they're like, I don't know who this person is, unfollow. I don't remember mm -hmm. why I followed them. You have to post consistently. I think that's probably my biggest tip. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. And then I'll, I'll add to that a little bit by saying, um, you know, like if you're worried about overposting, that's a good reason to have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, YouTube. You know, if you have enough different social media networks, then you can spread it out a little bit more. Um, but yes, posting every day, that's, I was so resistant to that. You know, I was, re I was resistant get it, to getting a Twitter account, 
and Instagram. I mean, I just now you I've, post on Twitter all the time too. Yeah, um, Twitter, Twitter, I guess is easier because Twitter is automated through YouTube to where you know I have it set up like if I post a new video on YouTube, it'll go to Twitter. Um, Buffer has been helpful. Do you use Buffer? Yes. Yeah. So Buffer is for for everyone who doesn't know. It is a website that lets you queue up. Uh, I think the free version lets you queue up 10 social media posts at a time. But you can set within each post, you can say, post this one thing to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn. I think that's it for the basic version. And then I think if you do the pro version, you can add other networks. But that's super easy. You queue up 10 different posts you know, every 10 days and sit back and just let it go. Yeah. My next tip on this that a lot of people get kind of, well, they just do it wrong. We'll just be blunt. They mm -hmm. will link their Facebook page to their Twitter account. I don't know if you do this and I apologize for being blunt about yeah. it, but they'll link their Twitter account and their Facebook account. So every time they post something on Facebook, it automatically posts over on Twitter. That is the best way to lose followers on Twitter and to not grow. You have to look at each platform individually. They each have their own sort of etiquette and you're going to tailor each post or word craft each post to what fits best. I mean, you're limited on characters on Twitter. You've got yeah. a very short amount and you want to use your hashtags with Facebook, you can post a lot longer. You still don't want to post novels because people aren't going to be interested in reading a novel. You want to get to the point as quickly as possible. Um, that's a big one. So just make sure you're tailoring each one. And if you've got your Facebook page connected to your Twitter account, disconnect them right now or don't bother with Twitter at all. Yeah. That is the worst thing you can do to try to grow your Twitter or any of your social media. So definitely I wouldn't be connecting those. Um, you want to be personable. You want to be a human. Don't do the whole, you know, we at La Cree Fine Art just finished this painting. Who's we? Me and my studio mm -hmm. assistants don't care. Like, it's weird. Don't try to be a corporation. Be yourself. People are buying into what you're creating, into you. There, I mean, most of our artwork, you're going to find another artist who does something similar. Make yourself mm -hmm. stand out by being yourself. Post about yourself. I mean, don't cross the line. I'd leave politics and such out uh, unless you're a political artist. But other than that, I mean, be yourself. Talk like you would to a friend within reason, depending mm -hmm. on how you talk to your friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think one thing I did in regards to linking uh, on YouTube, as I mentioned earlier, you can have YouTube automate some things and post to Twitter for you. See, that's now, a little different, though, because you're still that is OK. It's your well, Facebook to Twitter is, I think, the biggest issue. There, there was one aspect of it, though. I had it, I had it set to any time I add a video to a playlist, it, it posts it on Twitter. So I'd, go, <laughs> so I'd go through and go, OK, hey, I got a bunch of videos about birds. I'll make a birds playlist. And then all of a sudden, bam, eight posts in a row on Twitter. And people are like, what are you doing, dude? This is spam. And the so, same thing, Fine Art America. I know a few amazing artists who did that where they automatically linked anything with Fine Art America and they would post like 50 paintings uploaded and it would just nonstop trying to sell. Like it looked like they yeah. were spamming you. That's not what their intent mm -hmm. was, but yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I unlinked that process and now I just have it. When I post a new video, it automatically posts to Google and to Twitter. And that's fine. That, that's yeah. not irritating anybody. But if I, for months, I was doing that where I was adding stuff to playlists and I wasn't paying any attention until a couple of people were like, you know, they they posted and said, un, you know, unfollow because you <laughs> post too much. And I'm like, uh oh, yeah, So you can. And I see people do that a lot with with automated things on Facebook and other places, too, where they they're they're clicking something within a completely different website and they have no realization that it's spam posting you know however many in a row mm -hmm. on, on their social media and so yeah that is a good way to, to drive people away yeah and don't feel like you have to be on every social media platform out there pick the ones that you're good at and stick with it if that means facebook and instagram alone go with that if it's just whatever ones you're going to be good at do but don't try to stretch yourself too thin i did that for a while where i was posting on tumblr and all of these other things but i would kind of half do all of them i wasn't really putting much attention into any single one and that isn't a good way to go pick your few that you're going to really focus on and focus on those mm -hmm. and if you have some sort of analytics like uh, google analytics or youtube analytics and you can see your traffic sources that's a good way to see like okay I'm actually getting views from Twitter, whereas I only got one view this whole month from Tumblr. So what's the point in 
yeah. spending an hour writing a Tumblr blog if no one's really going to see it, you know? Yeah. Let's see. What else do we have here? I keep... Oh, who asked it? Now I'm not going to say the name because I, I saw the question earlier and now I didn't. Oh, here we go. Steam Powered Pixie asked what my favorite smart art box was so far, just because I can answer that quickly. The Ink Tense, because it introduced me to Ink Tense, and that's one of my favorite mediums to work in. And then this water, or no, sorry, it's an oil painting. I have it on my wall next to my desk. It's a little Van Gogh inspired, painted with a palette knife. The lighting is horrible, but that would be my other favorite. So nice. that was a quick one to answer. Yeah. That, those ink tents blocks look fun. I'll have to try those. Oh, they're amazing. They're not light fast, but they photograph really well. So making prints, they're great with. But, oh, they're, I love working with them. I need, to t I need to take like a month or two and just do some traditional videos rather than digital. Because I have this whole room that's full of art supplies. Like I've got like hundreds of mats and acrylic bags and tons of paint and brushes. And uh, I, I got... I was at the thrift store and they had these tubs of Prismacolor colored pencils. So I have like literally like thousands of Prismacolors in like pretty much every different color. And I got them for like 15 bucks, which oh, is crazy. Wow. Um, but it's like, I just need to use this stuff. I'm like hoarding it, like gotta have all these art supplies. <laughs> and then I, I don't ever use them, but someday. You can always rotate like I do. Every week it's a different medium. So it makes me try all the other things. I have a mm -hmm. few things. Winsor & Newton actually sent me a set of their pigment markers. Have you tried those yet? Mm -mm. I that like cool. them for blending and for, now I'm not, a, I don't work in markers. I liked these. I had fun with these. So I don't like the paper that they have you work on, but the markers themselves, I loved. Unfortunately, they apparently only work on that type of paper. It's like 20 pound oh. weight. So it's like super, super, lightweight which is unfortunate but yeah i try to switch from point was one medium to another it keeps me from getting bored which is nice mm -hmm. i'm all over the place on my channel it's like it's just kind of whatever i feel like doing sometimes i'll go off on tangents but you know I, I had somebody complain the other day that i was making too many videos for beginners but it's like i was doing that because then before that i had somebody complain that you know i had too many advanced tutorials and it's like you can't please everybody yeah so i'm just trying to throw out just a little bit of everything yeah. because that's just how i am as an artist if you look at my portfolio on, on my website aaronrutten.com it looks like a collection of like 50 different artists you know like the, the butterfly you see down here below me that that's a, a digital watercolor painting and it's very very different from like some of the surrealism that i have or abstract paintings or concept art or impressionism you know I, I like I like that variety for me it's it's fun because I'm learning something new or I'm getting outside of my comfort zone that experimenting too is so important because that's how you grow as an artist you don't the people who just stay with one thing they don't experiment they don't separate themselves from anybody else because they didn't try anything new so I think it's so important to try different different styles i mean even looking at the photos that we have posted here the goldfish below me i've got this abstract background mixed with realism you're not going to have that if you don't experiment like it's kind of a really cool style that i'm excited about it's different it's but it take you have to experiment don't be afraid to try something new is a big big tip i have for everybody yeah. it's it's refreshing to like you, you people talk about art block and it's like well the best way to get art block is to only do the same thing all the time you know so Louis Edwards asks, how do you get an image onto a large canvas? This is another lots of different ways answer. Yeah, I, the, the grid transfer method um, we talked about earlier, that that's the way to do it. Uh, projector. Mm -hmm. Projector you know, or, is a or, great way. Um, I just got recently the Artograph 8, Inspire 800. That thing is amazing. The room can be super, super light and you can still see every bit of detail. So even if you're somebody who doesn't like to trace, you want to draw it on your own, but you want to draw it small, you can then import it into a projector and blow it up to the size that you want. So it's not that you just have to trace with those. You can use them in so many different ways. I can even watch movies on that thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't and see I, why that would be practical, but I could. And you, you have a good video on, is it okay to trace? But um, I, I also have talked a lot about this on my channel tracing to get your sketch right is is just to save time and it, it's if you know how to freehand draw it's not a big deal to save yourself some time that's more time that you can spend on the other details the other 95 percent of what it takes to make a realistic painting 
Um, tracing is not going to help you with color. It's not going to help you with form. It's not going to help you with all of the other stuff that goes into making that painting what it is, you know, when it's complete. And so I think people, people obsess a little too much on tracing as if it's wrong to do. And it's, I mean, really, what are you doing? You know, like, like if you're looking at a reference photo, your mind is tracing it with, with your brain, you know, and you're taking that and you're then freehand drawing it. And that's a form of tracing. So I don't, I personally don't see a problem with, I don't, I don't always do it, but if it's going to save me some time and I feel like that's, that's essential to me being able to complete the piece in a timely manner, I'll definitely do it. Yeah. Well, it means for me, it means I get to create a lot more artwork in my lifetime. We have a mm -hmm. limited amount of time to create as much work as possible. And so I'm going to take every tool, use every tool available to me to make as much artwork as possible. Sometimes I'm in the mood to freehand. And so I freehand, sometimes I trace. The funny thing is I intentionally do not tell people what I freehanded, what I traced because no one ever guesses correctly. It's, yeah. it just proves the point. You can't tell, it doesn't make a difference. Use what tools you have available to you. I mean, if I had to mow the lawn, I'm going to use a lawnmower, not a pair of scissors. Use yeah. what's going to make you get the most work done in the least amount of time, I think. Plus, tracing also helps people who don't know how to draw, helps them to draw more accurately. It starts forcing their brain to see things correctly. If you draw the wrong or something incorrectly over and over and over again, you hopefully will slowly get better, but not as fast as if you were drawing it correctly over and over and over again and then tried freehanding it. You're going to mm -hmm. learn so much faster. And I've been teaching this way for gosh 17 years trust me it works i always like when people argue with me about it i'm like 17 years of experience tells me that it does work yeah i i, I gotta agree on that um so much of drawing is observation and i think people people initially don't see the difference between looking at something and observing it looking at something is like you can stare at anything you can be completely bored and zone out and not pay any attention to details but when you're making an observation you're going okay this person's head is oval shaped. This person's head is square. This person has sl squinty eyes. This person has huge eyes, you know, thick eyebrows, thin eyebrows, and so on. And if you focus on those very small specific areas of somebody's face, you know, even the eye, like what shape is the eye? What color is the eye? How thick are the eyelashes? that's that's how you end up internalizing all of those things and then you can use use them to draw from imagination or you're not you're not stressing so much about like how do i draw this because you're you're hunting around on a very fine scale rather than looking at the whole thing and in tracing it's forcing you to do that it's forcing you to as you're tracing around the eye to only be looking at the eyelid as you're drawing it and then when you move on to the nose you're only looking at the nose and only looking at the nostril rather than if you're you know, you're not tracing and you're freehand drawing, you're constantly like looking at the whole piece and it, it it's distracting, I think. Yeah. There's just, a, I think there are a lot of benefits to tracing and in the learning process, but as long as that's not the only thing you're doing, I think it's important yeah. to do both, to freehand and trace and freehand and trace because you learn different things from both, so. Well, and then, and then what do you do if, if what you're drawing is something that doesn't have a reference photo, you know? Like uh, that, I, that happens to people all the time where they'll, they'll make a composition, they used all these reference photos, but then they want to add in something like a, a monster or something. And it's su such a creative made up kind of monster to where they can't go on Google images and type in something, you know, they actually have to, even if they take pieces of other monsters and animals and combine them together, there's still going to be areas in the painting where you're going to have to use your imagination, you know, maybe it's a hand position, maybe it's clothing or, or something that has to be unique to your piece. And at that point, tracing isn't going to do you any good at all because you can't find a reference, you can't trace it, so. Yeah. Radicuda asks, how would you suggest someone garner the motivation to start drawing? That's a good question. Hmm. To get motivation to start drawing, that, that's a tricky thing because, I mean, like you, you and I, we have to do it as jobs. And so that's our motivation, yeah. you know, but, but <laughs> I think, bills, buying groceries. I think, <laughs> I think also like I'm the kind of person who was born or, or very early had a drive to make art. And it's something it's like, it's like I get hungry and I have to eat or I get tired and I have to sleep. I have to make art. It's not, it's not that I'm forcing myself to do it. But there are days when I get up and I, I don't feel like 
working. I don't feel like making art. Fortunately for me, I'm, you know, self-employed. And if I want to take a day off, I can usually. But a day um, off? What is that? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, those can you share? I don't really ever take a day off. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, there's always something I'm doing. But, you know, I, by taking a day off, I mean, push all of the, the responsibilities aside that I, I set up the day before and do them the next day. Um, <laughs> Music can help um, getting in an environment where you're comfortable, you know, like without a lot of distractions and maybe maybe going outside and painting if you can do that, you know, like take a trip somewhere and just make yourself do it. Or maybe you'll get inspiration from what you're seeing around you. Take requests from people or use a random word generator online to randomly generate a word or to randomly generate colors. That, that's a good way to do it for me. Like, for example, if I'm like, what am I going to draw in this video or in this live stream? Usually what I'll do is I'll ask the audience, what do you want me to draw? There's my answer. That's what I'm going to draw. I don't have to think about it and debate it. Um, you know, if I'm doing a tutorial and I, I need a subject or something or colors to use, I'll randomly generate that stuff, go through a few options. If I don't like the first few words, skip them. And then when I find one I like, that's what I'll draw. My music is a big one and not just music if because sometimes if I listen to the same thing I've been listening to the same playlist that won't motivate me if I will listen to something like if I've been listening to folk music try techno try classical try something totally they're all things that I like it's not just choosing something randomly you don't like but a different style than what I've been listening to for some reason that will always motivate me um cup of tea that's like my it's time to work i've got to have my iced tea or hot tea whatever um that's a big one go to a royalty free reference photo site like pixabay morg file and search through macro you'll find if you just look for macro photos you find so many great things butterfly birds whatever it is sometimes when you just see that right image where you're like i have to paint that i have to create that or i know if i combine this photo with this photo like you get ideas start thinking start getting yourself in that mind frame and i think for you and i because we are always in the what are we going to create next mind frame that's just how we live it's a mm -hmm. little bit easier and so if you're not already there to start te teaching your brain to think that way constantly be thinking about things that you can paint when you're out walking somewhere if you see a certain tree if you've got your cell phone with you always take photos of stuff that you're like wow that's cool looking but having those photos really i think that really helps i also keep a file on my computer that is just with royalty free reference photos that i saw sometime in the past and i thought it was cool i'll do something with this later sometimes when i look through those you'll see something that's so cool and it just inspires you to you liked it at one point so you're probably going to like it got all of your good photos in one location that's a way that i will motivate myself sometimes mm -hmm. and i'm glad you mentioned royalty free too because um it's it's just good about patreon.com slash lockery <laughs> you have some on there too is that um so uh, our next we have little talks asks how do you improve your concentration or patience for more complex pieces hmm do you want to take that one first i listen to audiobooks that is my big, like, if I am having a hard time, I don't want to sit still because there are times where I want, the weather's nice. I want to go outside and do stuff, but I have to work. So listening to audiobooks it will definitely help me to sit still a lot longer, more so than music. I may use tired initially, but then I'll, if I really have, no, I'm going to be doing something photorealist and tons of little detail, I'm going to switch and listen to audiobooks. They make such a difference in getting me to sit still and work on that fine complex work mm -hmm. for me i think if i really need to concentrate not so much for art because i i can i can have music going and make art it's it's more like if i'm trying to write or or i'm really like something's really complicated and i really don't want to mess it up like my website or something like that i'll turn the music off because when the music's on i'll be thinking about the lyrics or thinking about changing the song and it's a constant distraction but uh, for the most part I, I can I can work with music on um, I have ADD to some degree I don't know if officially I have it like I haven't been diagnosed with it but I can get distracted like that like I'll I'll be working on something and then all of a sudden I'll check Facebook and then Facebook will make me think about some other website and I'll go there but then I'll forget what I was even on that website for to begin with and I'll go somewhere else and do something and then all of a sudden I'll be like eating a sandwich or something and I'm like, wait, 
like I was just working on a painting and then, you know, <laughs> I got to go all the way back and I just have these layers and layers of distractions. And so I find that if I can eliminate all that stuff and just like not have Facebook up, not have my phone near me, put my phone on vibrate or on silent or whatever, the fewer things that are going to like pull me away from what I'm doing, the easier it's going to be to stay focused. And if I do need a break, like I'm just, I've been working on it for so long that I'm just sick of working on it. It's fine to just take a break and then come back to it. Let's see, we've got, where was it? I just saw it, it was a good one. Um, Steam Powered Pixie asks, which art book would you recommend? I don't really have, I, I have a couple art books and I've read, read quite a few, but personally, I don't really, don't really read art books. So <laughs> um, I like this they're... question because I had my two art books right next to me. So I'm like, I can show them on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, there, there are a couple. Um, I believe that they are public domain now. Um, the Andrew Loomis method of drawing heads, I believe you can probably get that as a PDF online. That's a good one. And it's from, maybe this, I believe it's from like the 50s or something. It's a good method for drawing heads. Um, a couple books I've read in the past, uh, The Marvel Way of Drawing. Since I was really into comic books as a kid, that's kind of helped me a lot in the way that I draw people. Um, Oh, we are offline. Are we? That must have just happened. Yeah, I'm seeing that in the comments, and I just looked right now. We're offline. Huh. Uploading the archive. Well, I think, I mean, I think we're about an hour in, so. Mm, almost. Well, no, not really. No. It was 138 when we started. Um... Should I try refreshing the page? Will that make anything? I mean, I, we can stop it if we need to. But... Well, it's, it's, if you'll have to stop it with an OBS and then start it again. It, it should just play within the same link if oh, you stop it's live and start again. it. Cool. Wait, Are it says li live, but it says live health, health stream. Stream has resumed. Stream is continuing. Is anyone hearing this? I don't know. Let's see. Says offline to me. Let me try. Okay, now we're back. <laughs> this this will be an interesting uh, video when it goes up later. Let's see. Okay, I think it's live again. It, it looks like it is to me. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, this has been a um, just technical difficulty today. Mhm. Mm so I don't know where that cut off. Um, I just yep. started seeing. Um, people commenting that they were not on online. Yeah. I will say for, I, we're talking about books, you may or may not know that now, um, that we recommend. <laughs> I have two that I really like. One is by James Gurney. It is Color and Light. This book is awesome. The other one that I really like, if you are a oh, colored pencil artist, this is a must have. Offline. This is the Colored Pencil Bible by Aliona Nicholson. These are the two that I have hard copies of. All other books I have are pretty much digital copies because I don't have space for everything. These two are like definite must haves for me. I think it went off again. Sorry. Oh, maybe. Um, let's, let's maybe, because it might just keep doing this intermittently. Um, I wonder what we should do. Because I mean, it's it's not the end of the world if it just cuts off a little bit at the yeah. end. But but we should let everybody know that that maybe we're going to end it. Well, it's um, live but buff buffering right now. Yeah. Let me try this. I'm going to pop. Let me pop out the chat here. Let's see if it's. Is it going to upload the stuff? Like, how does that work with OBS? If we're offline, that part just cuts out of the video stream, or I don't even know how any of this works. It's probably going to show a bunch of videos. Like each time it cut off, that'll be a separate video. Oh my gosh, but, that is but terrible. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. So, so that one good stretch that we had should uh -huh. be fine, and and then you can just delete the other ones because they're probably. I mean, you'll have to watch them and see. Um, Worst case scenario, you can um, 
I don't know if you want to do it, but I, I can always do it. If you send me the, the files, I can splice them together and send them back and you can just upload it as a separate video that's, you know, that doesn't have the gaps. I've done that before. How would I do, how? Um... So, so, let's see, are we, are we still live? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it says that it's live and that the stream has resumed, but it's buffering. Hmm. Well, let's, let's go to OBS and let's click stop streaming so that we're not just like, <laughs> people aren't watching us be like, what do we do? Um, and then, yeah, well, um, the video, the longer video that we recorded, it'll take a minute to process, but then it'll be available in your video manager. And you'll probably just want to just download that as an MP4 and then if there are any other pieces that were related to that that we can attach to it, um, we can download those and then just put them into a video editing application, um, piece them together, you know, so that it's just one clip and then render it as a video and then upload that. Okay. And then make the make the pieces themselves. You could either delete them or just make them unlisted or whatever, and then it'll be it'll be basically the the same result as if we'd finished the live stream. Yeah, I'm, it's I'm showing not... 51 minutes, so I guess we're we're good. Yeah, um, I, I think that's long enough. I mean, it's yeah. not the absolute best way to end it, but I mean... I wish it would come back on so we could at least say, hey, okay, we're done. Yeah, well, we can try. If, if you stop the stream and start it again, we can... Start stream. Hey, it actually so let... stopped that time when I hit stop. So that let's... Different from earlier. Let's, let's one more time try to um, oh, say, say what you were back. saying about... Uh, say what you were saying about the books, and then we'll splice that in. Okay. So hopefully you guys are seeing this this time. Um, the two books that I recommend, the first one is by James Gurney. This one is, there, now we're on screen. This is Color and Light. Such a good book for understanding just light. It's just great. You should get it. The other book that I really like, and I'm trying to say this fast before we get kicked offline again, is if you are a colored pencil artist, must-have book is Colored Pencil Painting Bible. This one is by Aliona Nicholson. I like it so much. I have mine signed. There. Now you can all be cool. jealous of my signed book. But um, <laughs> this one, I actually have digital and a hard copy because I love it so much. So those are my two big book recommendations. Cool. Um, well, I think since we're having a little bit of difficulty here that I guess we decided we're going to wrap this one up because we're at about an hour anyways. Um, as you can see down at the bottom, I have some links to my, or I have a link to my YouTube channel. It'd be cool if you would subscribe if you're interested in checking out some of my tutorials. They are um, mostly about digital painting, but a lot of the things I go over and the, the techniques that I talk about can be applied to, to traditional art as well. Uh, so definitely check that out if you're interested. Uh, there'll be links on there for my other other websites like uh, aaronrutten.com is my main website. And then I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Google Plus and all that stuff. So I'd love to have you join me there. And yeah, that's how we're wrapping this up. Total awkward <laughs> ending. Um, we, I'm sure we'll do this again in the future and hopefully I won't have as many mm -hmm. connection problems. I don't know what's going on, but you know, it's my first time using this. Hey, it, happen it happens so. to, ha it happens to everybody when you live stream. No one, no one's immune to, to the, um, computer gremlins. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us again. We'll do this in the future because it's actually easier for me to do live Q and A's than the Q and A videos, even though the mm -hmm. Q and A videos are only like five minutes long. So. This will definitely be happening again in the future. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you again sometime in the near future, and hopefully over on Aaron's channel, too. Don't forget to subscribe to him. Bye. Thanks. See you later.